This video was brought to you by Brilliant. The first 200 people to use the link below will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. As we've detailed in other videos, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has stalled over the last few weeks or so, with Russian forces unable to make much progress into Kyiv or towards Odessa. Focus has now turned to Mariupol though, a city formerly home to 446,000 people sitting on the coast in Ukraine's southeast. Over last month, the city has become surrounded by Russian forces. So in this video, we're we'll taking a look at the siege of Mariupol, whether the Russian forces will be able to take it and what it tells us about the war more generally. Before we start, only about a quarter of you have subscribed to the channel thus far. So if you want to make sure you don't miss out on anything during this difficult and important time, then subscribe and join the TLDR gang. So let's start with some context. Mariupol is the 10th largest city in Ukraine and the second largest in the Donetsk Oblast. It's traded hands a few times since war broke out between Russian separatists and Ukrainian security forces in 2014. In May of 2014, Russian-backed forces from the Donetsk People's Republic briefly captured the city, before Ukrainian security forces took it back just a month later. In January 2015, DPR forces once again tried to take the city, but were repelled by Ukrainian forces in what's now known as the Battle for Mariupol. And since then, the city has been under Ukrainian control. When it comes to the current crisis, Mariupol was one of the Russian army's first targets when the invasion began. Sitting between Crimea and the separatist bits of Donbass, Russian control of Mariupol would have provided them with a continuous land bridge from Crimea to Russia. Control over Mariupol would also give the Russians another strategically important seaport, as well as access to industrial infrastructure. So it's obvious why it was a target. And Putin and Russian officials probably also thought that Mariupol would be pretty easy to occupy, and that's for three reasons. Firstly, Putin probably thought that Mariupol would fall pretty easily. Russian forces could, and indeed did, come from Crimea in the west and Donbass in the east to quickly surround the city. Secondly, Mariupol is relatively pro-Russia, with 92% of Mariupol residents being Russian-speaking. And a poll from late 2020 found that a 54% majority of Mariupol residents identify as Soviet, while just 15% identify as European. That same polling found that two-thirds of Mariupol residents oppose Ukrainian accession into NATO or the EU, so it's likely that Putin thought they'd be on his side. Third, Mariupol is also the base of the Azov Battalion, a neo-Nazi Ukrainian nationalist group named after the neighboring sea of Azov. The Azov Battalion made their name defending Mariupol and other bits of Donbass from Russian-backed separatists, and, at least according to the 2018 Open Democracy Report, have established political control on the streets of Mariupol. While they might be an effective fighting force, Azov are, to put it mildly, not great blokes. And Putin probably thought that Mariupol residents would be grateful to the Russian army for getting rid of them. You get the point. Mariupol is at least more pro-Russian than your average Ukrainian city, and the Russian army probably thought they'd be able to occupy it in just a couple of days. As you probably know though, things haven't panned out as the Russians hoped. In the first few days of the war, Russian forces were repeatedly repelled by their Ukrainian counterparts, and after a few days of this, Russia started resorting to siege tactics. On February 28th, electricity, gas, and internet connection to most of the city was cut, and by March 2nd, the city was basically completely surrounded, and there were even reports of water outages. Since then, Russia has been continuously shelling the city, with strikes hitting civilian targets, including schools and hospitals. 4,000 civilians in the area have been confirmed dead, but the deputy mayor estimates that the true number could be about 20,000. This humanitarian crisis has been exacerbated by the fact that both Russia and Ukraine were unable to agree on humanitarian corridors for people to escape. In fact, Russian forces violated a ceasefire intended to allow Mariupol residents to flee the city and Ukraine then rejected Russia's proposal for humanitarian corridors leading into Russia. 
On March 12th, Russian forces captured parts of Mariupol's eastern outskirts, and over the next few days, some 20,000 civilians were allowed to leave the city. On March 20th, Russia told Mariupol to surrender or face, quote, military tribunals. And just the next day, Ukraine rejected this ultimatum. But what happens next, now that Mariupol has refused to surrender? Well, Russia will probably intensify its bombing campaign before entering the city. The US has already reported that Russian ships in the Sea of Azov have begun bombing Mariupol from the south. And this will almost definitely mean more civilian casualties, as there are some 100,000 civilians stuck in the city. The ensuing battle between the 14,000 Russian troops around the city and the 3,500 or so Ukrainian troops left in Mariupol will likely be similarly horrific. Unfortunately for everyone, there's apparently little chance of escalation. Mariupol no longer has any obvious strategic value. Mariupol officials now think that about 90% of the city's infrastructure has been destroyed, which means that it can't really act as part of a grand land bridge between Crimea and Russia anyway. But Putin will still be desperate to capture it for a few different reasons. Firstly, the Russian army just needs a win, and Mariupol would be the largest city to fall so far. Secondly, Mariupol is the home of the Azov Battalion, a neo-Nazi group formed in 2014 to fight Russian-backed separatists in the region. Taking Mariupol and defeating Azov would allow Putin to claim that he successfully denazified the country, one of his stated objectives before the war began. Thirdly, the Russian bombardment of Mariupol is clearly intended as a message to other Ukrainian cities. If you don't surrender, you'll face a similar fate. All in all, a further humanitarian catastrophe in Mariupol looks basically inevitable, and the rest of Ukraine will be watching to see what might happen if their city ends up surrounded. Ultimately, if Mariupol does fall, then the odds of a good outcome for Ukraine do shift. It's certainly not over, but it will be a big win in Putin's favour. And if these kind of probabilities and predictions aren't your thing, then you should check out Brilliant. Brilliant is an online STEM learning platform that turns complex subjects into fun and interactive experiences. I actually did a computer science degree, and I've loved exploring Brilliant to refresh my skills, as well as learning new ones to help with my current job, like their superb statistics courses. But you don't need any kind of background in STEM. If you just want to spend a bit of time building your skills, then you can do it right away, with no long boring lectures like the ones I had to sit through. Sorry to my former university. Instead, you can learn through interactive games and puzzles, the kind of thing you actually want to do. There's something at all levels too, with more advanced courses on things like neural networks and even quantum computing. Just pick a course that you're interested in and get started. They're all designed by award-winning instructors and built upon the principle of active learning. So you're gaining STEM knowledge by actually doing it. Brilliant helps you learn new things and sharpen your skills. So if you want to improve with STEM, then you should sign up to Brilliant at brilliant.org forward slash TLDR EU. And the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks so much for supporting the channel.